and we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Kim Miller and I am a health sciences librarian at the Idaho State University Libraries. I'm joining you from Meridian today. And I'm also a member of the Open and Affordable Education Resources Committee, who is helping to sponsor our Open Education Week presentations. We are really excited to have Dr. Darcy Graves with us today, who is one of our 2022 Textbook Hero nominees. Uh, Darcy Graves is an assistant professor and director of both the Master of Social Work and Gender and Sexuality Studies programs at Idaho State University. She has a PhD in cultural studies and social thought and education from Washington State University and a master's degree in social work from Boise State University. Her areas of research include U.S. gun culture and mental and emotional health and well-being, focusing specifically on rural communities. So we will hear from Dr. Grace, and then you will have some time to ask questions or have a conversation, and I will give the floor over to Dr. Grace. Great. Thanks, Kimberly. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I just have a couple of slides today or like to organize my thoughts. Okay, so thanks for having me here today. I think I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the process that I went through to transition one of our core gender and sexuality studies courses over to OER. Um, and just a little bit briefly talk about what the process looked like, um, how we're managing the quality control process um, now that the course has been implemented and fully transitioned. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges and outcomes that we've had uh, in respect to that transition. Um, so as Kimberly mentioned, I'm the Director of Gender and Sexuality Studies here at Idaho State. And we do have a Gender and Sexuality Studies minor um, and one of the foundation courses that we teach as part of this minor curriculum is, is Sociology 2201, or Introduction to Gender and Sexuality. And we, as a department, identified this class uh, specifically as one that was a good candidate to be transitioned to OER for a few reasons. Um, one of the, the sort of pieces of the identification process was just that we were already at a point in the curriculum where we needed to... Um, review the textbook that we were using at the time. Uh, the textbook that we were using was uh, previously published in 2015, uh, which doesn't seem like that long ago, because uh, in my mind, 2001 was still 10 years ago, um, but it actually is kind of a long time ago. And some of the curricular content in the textbook that we were using didn't reflect contemporary policies. So one of the issues that we were coming up was the textbook still talked, for example, about gay marriage, um, as if it was not legal, and the textbook was still framing that particular social issue as um, a, an unsettled matter of, of law and was referring to gay marriage still as an illegal um, construct. And so that was something that often created a lot of confusion for our students and was something that we had to spend a lot of time in class talking about and, and kind of explaining that the textbook was published prior to uh, this sort of change, the social change in gay marriage. And so there were a couple of other really you know, pertinent examples in the textbook that didn't reflect contemporary um, realities. And so we knew that we needed to do um, reconsider the textbook. And it became very clear to us that the author of this particular textbook wasn't likely going to be releasing a new edition of the textbook anytime soon. Um, and we were in this kind of awkward position. This is kind of, this is very tangential to OER, but uh, the author of the textbook, who had historically been sort of a foundation figure in the world of gender and sexuality studies, had uh, recently um, come under fire because several of his graduate students had come out and credibly accused him of sexual harassment. And so we were in this sort of awkward position where we were teaching a class on gender and sexuality with a textbook that had been authored by like, a serial sexual harasser. And um, the author had been sort of uh, lost his membership in a lot of professional organizations. And so this sort of expedited our um, need to review the textbook. Um, we thought we really need to rethink this textbook. And uh, even if the author is going to release a new edition of the textbook, which probably is never going to happen, uh, didn't really seem like a great fit for the for the class after that information came out. Um, and so, you know, given that kind of um, 
the need for a new textbook, some of the, the sort of uh, realities of what was or was not being covered in the textbook um, really made us start to think about this class as being a good candidate for transition to OER. Um, and then kind of the, the big thing that pushed us towards OER as opposed to just another textbook was just the number of students who take this class on an annual basis. So um, this class does meet objective, um, objective nine for um, general education or requirements. And so we have a lot of students who take this class and they come from a lot of different academic disciplines. So we have really consistent and really high course enrollment in all sections of this class. And so this really became a good sort of opportunity for cost savings for students who are trying to take those general education requirements. Um, and then this all sort of happened at the same time that object, all of the objective nine courses at ISU were up for their five-year uh, annual review through the General Education Requirements Committee. And so all of these factors combined are what kind of contributed to our decision to really think about transitioning this class over to the OER model. Um, so just a little bit about the class um, to set the stage. Uh, so I did mention that this is uh, one of the objective nine classes. It meets the objective for cultural diversity of the general education requirements. Uh, we teach about three to four sections every academic year uh, with at least one additional section being offered in the summer. And we have about 175 to 200 students or more enrolled over the course of every academic semester. So we really do have a fairly high impact class. Um, when we think about the cost savings for, for moving to OER, we really do put a lot of students through this particular class. Um, part of what drives enrollment in this class is it is a required, obviously, for people getting a gender and sexuality studies minor, uh, but it's also required for students who are getting a major in social work or sociology. Um, but we also do see a lot of other academic majors uh, participating in this class because it does meet those, some of those common core requirements. Um, another big issue that kind of factors into how we transitioned this class is that we teach three to four sections every semester, and not all of the sections are taught by regular faculty. A lot of the sections are actually taught by graduate teaching assistants. And so one of the things that we have historically needed in this class is a very solid curriculum that can easily be picked up by a graduate teaching assistant or a, a member of the faculty who hasn't previously taught the class. Um, and so we really like to maintain one um, sort of main curriculum for this class that's then deployed across sections. So students taking every section of the class are more or less getting the same content, uh, taking the same exams, learning the same subject matter. And this makes it easier for us to manage all of the course sections, particularly when, when sometimes we have up to three graduate teaching assistants teaching various sections of the course. So when we set out to transition the course to OER, we were working on about a two-year timeline. We thought that it would take about two years for the transition to be fully uh, implemented and effective. And the very first thing that we did was we started with a review of all student course evaluations uh, from all sections of the course. So regardless of instructor, regardless of whether they took it as an, an asynchronous online class or an in-person class or a summer class, we went ahead and did kind of a systematic evaluation of all of the student course evaluations for the last five years. And this really helped us conceptualize where we needed to make improvements in the curriculum or where we needed to make modifications to the curriculum. And one of the overwhelming sort of pieces of feedback that we got from looking at that many course evaluations is that the class is called Introduction to Gender and Sexuality. Uh, but pretty consistently over time, students were identifying that the class had a lot of content on gender and not as much content on sexuality. And there really seemed to be a lot of interest across the board in more content on sexuality or sort of more, um, more equitable distribution, I think, of subject matter. And I think actually that is very was a very fair critique of the class, the way the course was set up before. It was about 80% uh, gender and maybe 20% sexuality. And so that really helped us as we were starting to think about changing the, getting rid of the textbook and bringing in our own sort of uh, curriculum and reading that really helped shape how we thought we needed to go about doing that. So the, those student course evaluations were very helpful to us. Um, then after reviewing all of the course evaluations, I actually had a meeting with all of the recent faculty and graduate teaching assistants who had taught sections of the class. 
uh, that were still around. So obviously some of the graduate teaching assistants have graduated and moved on from the college, but the ones that were still here were invited to participate. And then any members of our regular faculty who've ever taught this class before were invited to participate. And as a group, we uh, kind of went through some of the key findings or the, the key themes that emerged from the student course evaluations. And then I invited the, the faculty and teaching assistants to share any kind of feedback um, that they had from their experiences teaching the class. And then as a group, we um, were able to sort of sit down and conceptualize what an, a content outline would look like moving forward um, as we were shifting some of the content and moving away from a textbook. Um, so after those meetings and reviewing the course evaluations, um, I sat down and we created a, co a course content outline that was more reflective of an updated version of the curriculum. Uh, and then we set about reviewing all of the available open education resource textbooks on the market or the lack of market, I guess. Uh, and we reviewed a, a pretty high number of other open education resources as well. And our main takeaway sort of disappointingly is that there actually are not any adequate open uh, OER textbooks on the market specifically for gender and sexuality classes, which would have been really nice and convenient if there was just a really great um, OER textbook. But what we found was that most of the textbooks on the market are uh, sociology focused. So we found a lot of introduction to sociology textbooks that had maybe one chapter dedicated to gender and sexuality. Um, but we honestly really didn't find a great option for an OER textbook um, that was dedicated to gender and sexuality that we thought was going to meet the needs of our students. And so based on that, sort of after that systematic review, we realized that we were going to have to build our own reading list from scratch. Um, we were able to pull, there are, there are a few uh, gender and sexuality specific OER textbooks um, there's one, there's one really good one, but uh, every chapter is one page long. <laughs> and that is just really not a lot of content and didn't feel really like it was going to give our students a lot to work with, particularly given that, uh, you know, this class we offer in, in a seated class. So some of our students are getting the lecture component, uh, but we also offer this as an asynchronous online class. And so we have other students who get no lecture at all. And so the one the one page chapters might have been okay for the uh, seated students, but definitely not going to work for the asynchronous online students. Um, and I think just personally, I think I came from an academic background, like probably many of you, where the the standard for many of our classes was uh, like to read a book a week for every class. Uh, so I just personally had a really hard time swallowing the idea of reading, you know, like one page <laughs> for a week. I, I know that maybe there's some research out there that says that that's best practice for students, contemporary students, but I'm just, I'm not fully on board with that yet. So we realized we were going to have to build our reading content list sort of from scratch. We were able to pull um, from some pre previously existing textbooks, uh, like one chapter from one textbook on a specific topic, one chapter from another textbook on another topic. And so what we did was we we had uh, we worked with ITRC to build a, a development page in Moodle, and that functions as sort of now the master copy of the of the course. And this actually works really well for a class that you're teaching multiple sections with multiple instructors, because now we have one sort of master copy of the course that I'm the one that maintains that. And then any kind of major updates that are made to the course are made in that master development page. And then every academic semester, that page can then be copied over by all instructors assigned to teach sections of the class. And that way we don't have multiple versions of the class sort of floating out in the netherworld. Um, so we built this Moodle development page in Moodle and we started to build sort of week by week, topic by topic. Um, we would collect a variety of readings on topics, a variety of book chapters. Uh, we would collect probably 15 to 20 readings for every week. And then we would sort of go through and eliminate the ones that we didn't want or the ones that we thought might not be stable um, links. So if we were linking to something more contemporary, like a newspaper article, and we had concerns that that, might, that link might disappear at some point in the near future, uh, we would eliminate it from the list. And so we would, we would be started with these much longer reading lists that multiple people were able to contribute ideas to. And then we would pare those down to sort of hone in exactly precisely on the topic that we wanted students reading about for the week. 
um, and then making sure that what we were offering was going to be stable and consistent over time, because what we didn't want was uh, two years from now, all of our readings to disappear from the internet, <laughs> and then we would have to start over completely. Um, that was something we were really conscientious about. So once we had built an entire de development page that had all of the assigned readings that we wanted to use for the course, uh, we had a pretty nice mixture of textbook chapters, uh, contemporary newspaper articles, videos uh, that students could watch on YouTube or other platforms, and then also obviously peer-reviewed journal articles. So we had kind of a nice variety of different types of content and reading. Uh, then we set about with probably the most difficult task of the entire undertaking, which was to build a new exam bank. And so one of the biggest barriers for us in eliminating the existing textbook was textbooks come with these very nice exam banks. Um, and ex I know I don't really actually use exams, and I definitely don't use exam banks in my graduate level classes, but for an introductory level class with upwards of 200 students uh, in, a, in a semester, we do like to use those exam banks because it makes the grading process easier and it's a real nice consistent way to uh, quiz students on the reading and the course content. So building a new exam bank was a pretty significant undertaking. I have a lot of kudos to the publishers who have somebody that they pay somebody to write exam banks for their textbooks because that was a really time intensive um, undertaking. I was very fortunate in that I do have um, obviously graduate teaching assistants that were able to assist me in reading all of the articles that we were going to assign our students and then building exam bank questions based on those. Um, and similar to the readings, we developed an exam bank with significantly more questions than we thought we were going to need. And um, then in the summer session, uh, after the first sort of this whole process took about one year of our first year of our two year timeline, and then we actually ran a trial of the OER readings over the summer, um, which was nice because we only offer one section of the class in the summer. So we got to have more of like a focus group uh, group of students that went through this uh, for the first time. Uh, and it was really nice because actually there were a few links to readings that we thought were going to be stable that had already disappeared. <laughs> so we got to hear back from students like, hey, the assigned reading today no longer exists. And so that helped us sort of further hone our reading list to make sure that it was going to be stable over time. Um, and then we really paid close attention to the exam bank questions in that trial run over the summer session. And we flagged any question that more than 40% of the students in the class got wrong. And we reviewed it. And so we, some of the questions, I think they just got wrong because they didn't do the reading. <laughs> Because I, when we when we reviewed it, we thought, well, the question is good. The answer, you know, we, we think they should have been able to deduce the correct answer. But actually, some of the questions we pulled completely from the exam bank. Um, I think I had one TA that was a little overzealous with her uh, quiz questions that she would write. And the question would be about two full paragraphs of, of question. And so I think maybe I, in hindsight, should have paid a little bit more attention to some of the TAs and the questions that they were writing. And, and so those questions, we ended up, some of them we ended up pulling from the exam bank completely and others we just revised to make them more um, readable. Some of them were just really difficult to read and understand. And so we modified some of the exam questions based on that first group. So that was a nice little summer session. The students loved it because uh, when we pulled a question from the exam bank, we, we curved everybody's grade accordingly so that students didn't feel like they were, it was unfair that they were being, um, sort of guinea pigs for this trial run on a, on a new class. And so, of course, all the students were very happy at the end because most of them uh, saw a little bit of an inflation in their overall grade. Um, so we did that trial run during the summer session, and now we're in the middle of doing a, a trial for the full academic year. We're still monitoring our test banks. We've changed our parameters for flagging questions, so we don't flag them now unless more than 50% of the class gets the question wrong. Um, and we have so we're in our second semester of the trial run. Uh, last semester, we did still pull a few. Um, there were a few exam questions that we we kind of missed in the summer that were still a little problematic. Uh, we pulled those from our exam bank. And this semester, things seem to be going pretty well. So far, I've only pulled one question uh, from the bank. So I feel like at this point, we have a pretty well-established exam bank, uh, which was a pretty big undertaking. So we're continuing to do quality control. 
Um, so obviously we're continuing to monitor the exam banks, but we're also working on some accessibility concerns that popped up um, in that first trial run. We, we learned that there are some accessibility issues with anything that is uh, certain types of documents are more or less screen reader friendly, uh, which wasn't something that I had really fully accounted for when I was thinking about it. Um, some of our textbook chapters that were scanned um, came across as a little fuzzy. And, and so there are just some sort of quality control sort of pieces that we're paying close attention to. Uh, we've been working with the office, the disability um, office on campus to make sure that all of our um, scanned or um, non-internet based documents meet their standards for accessibility so that they are, uh, students can access them with something like a screen reader. Um, so we're really working hard to make sure everything is accessible. And then uh, we have been doing every semester. At the end of the semester, I've been meeting with all the faculty and teaching assistants who've taught course sections, um, just to get some general feedback and check in to see how things have gone. Um, one of the things that we're, we did change in the course redesign was we added a, a research paper to the curriculum. Um, and so that's something that we're keeping a very close eye on and, and looking for feedback on that as well to see how that affects students. Um, but the transition to OER is something that we have feel like the outcomes have been very positive. So we actually projected about a, a $40,000 annual cost savings for students at ISU. So the textbook we were using previously cost just under $100 to purchase. Obviously, some students were able to rent or purchase it uh, for a little bit less money from other places. But if we projected about 200 students annually, which is actually a fairly low projection, sometimes we've had upwards of 300 enrolled in, a, in an academic year in the class. Um, if we take those predictions, we, we came up with about an approximate savings of $40,000 a year, which is not insignificant. Like that's a lot of money that's going back into the hands of our students. The student feedback is consistently very positive. We hear very, very routinely from students that they really value the overall cost savings. They like that they don't have to buy a textbook for this class. Um, and we actually are also hearing pretty consistently positive feedback from both the faculty and graduate students teaching the class that they think it's going really well with the OER um, readings. The only piece of feedback that we are hearing, and this is kind of ironic and funny, is that some of the students do feel like asking them to read more than a textbook chapter is too much <laughs> reading in one week. Uh, I think the students probably would have been really happy with the one page um, per week textbook. Uh, but I kind of, um, I'm a mom, so I feel like it's kind of like when my kids tell me they don't want to eat broccoli, uh, I make them eat it anyways. And I kind of feel that way about reading, even if maybe they don't like reading something that's more than 10 pages long. Sometimes you just need to read something to get the, the content that you need. So overall, we've been really happy with this transition. Uh, I think there have definitely been a few bumps on the road, particularly with the exam bank. Um, but we feel like it's gone well. We're really happy that we made the decision to do that. Um, so that's just a little bit about our process. And I, I think I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of time for questions. So I'll open the floor to see if anybody has questions or comments. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I've um, heard this, a similar theme about um, exam banks in particular being one of the barriers um, to adoption for many of the reasons that you explained. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions or uh, comments or anything? I have a couple of questions for you. Thank you for your great stories. It was great anecdotal yeah. kind of exactly the kind of thing I would expect <laughs> right to us um, Can you tell me how you went about um, trying to figure out if the link was going to be stable and, and what that looked yeah. like? And, yeah, and I, I have a separate question I'll ask. Yeah, so it is, I mean, that is really hard to predict because we, I, I mean, I think we've all had that experience with online resources in the past is that I, sometimes I'll use it for five years and then suddenly it's gone and nobody, there's really no reason why. So one of the things that we looked at was we went um, into the, like, so if we were using an article, say, from a certain newspaper outlet, um, some of those places do publish how long the links are going to be stable online for. And so you have to do a little bit of digging, but that was kind of one metric that we looked at. Something else that we did was we would try to find links published by the same uh, group or, or person, and then we would go back and see how far back their other links were sort of maintained and in existence. And we really just tried to make sure 
Um, and, and sometimes like in gender sexuality, um, sometimes it's nice to use, like we, we do some pop culture kind of analyses. Um, like I show a, a Harry Styles music video in one of my classes that they have to analyze um, as a sociologist. And so uh, that on YouTube, like, is that going to be on YouTube forever? I mean, maybe, but probably not. Um, but then uh, for, for more sort of um, bigger items in the class, we really tried to stick with more traditional outlets that were going to have more stable um, timeliness, sort of timelines for accessibility. That's that's great. Thank you. I hadn't even realized that they would publish. Yeah, how long it was going to be active. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, my next question is just, um, what did you find out about any kind of copyright issues? Was there any problem with that? Because it's on websites, is it just okay to have the link? Or what are the, the roads to navigate there? Yeah, that's a great question. So my understanding, so, so for some of the textbook chapters that we pulled, my understanding with copyright laws and what we were advised to do is that as long as you're using less than 10% of the textbook, um, that you can um, that you can use textbooks as long as you're not using more than 10% of the text. So we were very conscientious about making sure if we did pull a chapter from a textbook that it was less than 10% of the full textbook and that we never use more than one chapter from the same text. Um, and so that was one thing that we really paid attention to. And then another thing that we paid a lot of attention to was um, with online textbooks. So online textbooks are you know, they're open, they're free, they're available. So there's really no copyright issues. Um, and then a lot of the um, other things that we utilize like re uh, research articles were are housed in our, within our library database. And so those would be available to students through the library. So we're, I mean, you're able to download a PDF and like, and put it on a Moodle page, but we also made sure that all of the PDFs that we used were also available through our library so that we knew that we were, we sort of had ownership of those. Yeah, and I just dropped a link to um, the library has a quick guide on copyright. Um, copyright is certainly really complex or can be yeah. complex. Um, and um, any of us are happy, you know, for folks who are interested in adopting to kind of help um, start wade through that. Um, but I just put a link um, in the chat if anyone is interested in, in learning more about copyright. Okay, what other oh, questions or comments? Questions. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions besides just me? Um, so, how do you how do you see your, yourselves keeping the content up to date and current going forward? I mean, this was a lot of work to put mm -hmm. this together. Um, what do you anticipate is going to be the workload going forward? Yeah, so I think when about once a year, I anticipate we'll need to go through all of the links and readings that we have to make sure that they're still relevant and accessible. And um, I think one of the that's one of the nice things about the Moodle development page is that we do have that master copy of the of the entire course. And so then we can deploy that. I think it's really easy when you have, you know, three to four different people teaching the same class every semester over four or five years, there tend to just be a lot of versions of the class out there. Um, and I know that when I, I'm, I've only been at ISU for two and a half years, and when I got here and took this over, there were there were about seven different versions of the class floating around, uh, which was really difficult for our TAs. Uh, <laughs> they're like, well, which one do I do? And which, what, which readings am I supposed to assign? And which syllabus is the right syllabus? And the answer was kind of all of them, right? Like all of them are fine. You can use whichever one you want. Um, but that kind of amount of choice was really overwhelming for our TAs. Like they don't really want to develop their own class, right? They're in graduate school, they're busy. So they really want us to just hand them. And really, ideally, we don't really want them, you know, going rogue and writing their own curriculum anyways, particularly in a class like gender and sexuality, where there are at this particular moment in time, like some real interesting uh, legal questions about like what we can and cannot and sure should or should not be teaching about. So we don't really want graduate students to just do whatever they want. So it's really nice that we have that kind of master Moodle page now that we that I kind of own and I manage. And then I do work with my TAs and I can give the T I can give my TAs access to it. Um, and, and also having TAs, I will admit, has made this process significantly uh, less onerous. And I'm not sure, probably if it had been just me, it would have been like a five-year time, <laughs> timeline. Uh, but I had three different TAs that were helping me 
uh, like review and pull readings and build test bank questions. Um, so I had a lot of support. It wasn't just me. And um, so the master development page, I think really does help uh, with that. So about once a year, I plan to go through, make any modifications or changes, but we're able to immediately change exam questions. All of our, you can build in Moodle. Um, you can connect exam questions to readings. And so if you eliminate a reading, it will actually tell you exactly which exam questions are associated with that reading. And so you don't have to go back like, oh, no, I need to read all my exam questions now and figure out which ones go with this reading. Because, you know, it, if we're being completely honest, I definitely have people who end up teaching this class who haven't done any of the readings, <laughs> right? They, they haven't read anything. They're like, I'm going to teach it this one time and I'm a TA and I'm going to, I'm going to read some, I mean, in theory, they tell me they read it all, but I don't think they've read any of it. So um, we can, we can identify which readings are associated with which exam questions. So if we pull a reading or if a link goes dead for a reading, we can easily identify which exam questions were attached to that. And then when we add a new reading to replace it, or if we just decide we're going to stick with what we already have, we can, we can pull other exam questions in from the bank um, to help with that. Any other questions? Great, great, great questions. I do have a question. Um, I'm happy to open it to others too, but I'm just curious, um, what was your favorite part of this process? You know, there's lots of challenges involved, there's lots of positives and negatives, but what was kind of your favorite part um, of working on this course and trans transitioning it to OER? Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the nice things about OER is that we're able to make sure the readings all reflect very current realities. And so in gender and sexuality studies, I think there are actually like it isn't really a settled uh, topic. I mean, there is a there are a lot of things that we've been studying for a really, really long time, and we can pull on, you know, more historic readings to establish foundation pieces of knowledge. So when we're talking about things like social construction theory, obviously, there's a lot of literature that's been around for a long time that talks about that uh, from a theoretical standpoint. But then as we're trying to apply that to sort of contemporary cultural realities that uh, we're living in a moment right now where things are changing very, very quickly. So um, there are things that we, uh, even if we had a new textbook that had been published in 2022, uh, that textbook would have talked about abortion as, as a matter of settled law. And now all of a sudden it's not. And so i I really like that the OER does give us a little bit of flexibility with making sure that the readings really do reflect like the up, up to date uh, what's happening in our in our culture and society. And, and I realize this is probably very discipline specific um, and, and other disciplines might not have the need to have set, you know, be able to modify readings on, on a very sort of last minute basis. But I was even modifying readings in the middle of the semester last semester on some of the, the topics that we that we teach about because things were happening so fast that we were realizing like, oh, like this, re this reading that we have assigned, no, it's no longer accurate. Uh, the information available here, all of a sudden it's completely irrelevant because it's now, it's now history. It's, it's no longer contemporary. And so we can still use it as a piece of history, but we aren't teaching that as sort of contemporary culture. So we really are able to adapt more quickly, I think, um, instead of the textbook industry, right, where we, we're still waiting for a textbook uh, that acknowledges gay marriage is legal. And um, <laughs> that's what it's been legal for a while. So it's kind of nice to be able to do that. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Graves, for sharing with us. It was very interesting to hear about your project. Um, we have several presentations this week, just like this. So I'm going to go ahead and put the blog post with the full schedule uh, in the chat in case you would like to join us for anything else. And um, thank you again all for joining us. And I will see you all uh, on Zoom some other time. Thanks so much, Kim. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks.